Today I watched a documentary which actually changed my worldview. Um, now I actually stand with uh, Israel. So stay with me as we review this documentary together. And it's titled Holy Redemption, Stealing Palestinian Land. Welcome folks, today we're diving into the captivating uh, world of Israel's uh, policy regarding the occupation in Gaza. And as always, it's pretty complicated. Join me as we go over the documentary by TRT and see what the experts have to say. Listen, we have a promise from Hashem in the prophecy that the third redemption will be the eternal one. It's not again to go and back. So hopefully we are now in the eternal one. First, did you hear this gem? Wow, I didn't realize we're signing up for a never-ending Netflix series. Who's binge-watching this eternal redemption anyways? If you have to leave this land, will you fight back? But I will fight with everything I can to stop this decision, the stupid decision. It will bring more blood, more people will be uh, killed because of those stupid decisions now in regards to leaving the land the sentiment is pretty clear who needs peace when we can have a full-on soap opera right he came to visit the soldiers guarding the hill overlooking duma it is clear who is in charge <laughs> Among the soldiers on this hill is a British citizen. Picture this, a British citizen among the Israeli soldiers. I mean, who wouldn't want a Brit guarding the hills of Duma? Talk about bringing in the heavy artillery or Maybe some tea. But you have to be Israeli to serve in the army, no? You do and don't. There's a thing called lone soldiers, which are people that come from abroad and can be soldiers in the Israeli army. It's like the French Foreign Legion. Nadi Ram, unaware of being recorded, explains to soldiers how he convinces tourists to support settlers. <laughs> Our soldier friend Neddy explains how he convinces tourists to support the settlers. It's like the ultimate vacation package. Come for the scenery, but stay from um, land disputes. It's a real win-win uh, situation, right? Yehuda Shimon is one of the settler leaders in the northern part of the occupied West Bank. There is no settlers. There is a communities and there is a people, they just live like everybody, every place in the world. Yehuda Shimon, a settler leader, insists there are no settlers, just communities. And yes, it's just like saying there are no sharks in the water, just enthusiastic swimmers. Do you see a Arab village or Arab city? There is a fence around? No, why? The Arabs know, everything go. And you know what? It's not just terror. This is a life way. That's the way they live. They kill all the time. If there is no Jewish, okay, let's kill each other. Okay, but we, we want to kill someone. Then there's the gem about the Arab villages. They kill all the time. That's pretty rich. Because clearly, there is no history of conflict on the other side. It's not like they're responding to decades of uh, oppression and persecution. Oh, 
My name is Yoshua uh, Mordechai Schmidt. You are a rabbi? Yes. The Torah said in the mitzvot that we must to be here and to build this place. Joshua, our friendly rabbi, says the Torah says that we must be here. Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Iran, Sudan, Qatar, a lot of uh, country uh, of Arabs. Why, why, why they stuck in Israel? Some of them came from Egypt, return to Egypt. Some of them are friends of Erdogan, will go. Some will go to Britain. Some will go to North America, South America, Indonesia, which is the biggest Islam. But not here. Here they proved to be impossible in the, in the Middle East. Oh, and when asked about the uh, Arabs, why don't they just go to other uh, countries? You know, classic, why don't they just... It's like uh, moving to another country, is just as simple as changing a channel. And I joined the IDF in 2005. I served in the Special Forces. Do you feel any regrets from the time you were in the army? Of course. Uh, I did things that, as a democratic citizen, I think you're not supposed to do. Now we have Nadev a former Israeli soldier, and he has some regrets. Aw, how cute. It's like a heartfelt apology, but with a twist. Sorry for the, all the chaos, but I just thought it would be more fun. So we're driving on route number 60. It's the main road of the West Bank, goes from north to south. And on our right-hand side, it's Hebron, the second largest Palestinian city in the West Bank. 230,000 Palestinians are living over there. Hebron, it's the only Palestinian city with a settlement inside of it. Driving on Route 60, Nadev points out that Hebron is the only city with a settlement inside. That's like saying that's the only house with a ghost living inside it. Hmm, it's a real conversation starter. All of the different settlements are on hilltops, on valleys, on the outskirts of Palestinian cities. But in Hebron, you have a settlement of 650 settlers that are, most of them declare themselves, they are Kahanists. They believe in the ideological views of the Rabbi Meir Kahana. Basically, they believe in Jewish supremacy. Ah, oh, and our friends, the Hanse settlers, who believe in Jewish supremacy. Because who doesn't have a good superiority complex? It's just like a country club membership, but with a lot more drama and a lot less golf. Suddenly you have 15 soldiers in your house uh, with weapons and everything and you just wake up and your children are screaming and crying. In Hebron is a, a microcosmos where you, you can understand how the, the occupation happens in the other parts of the West Bank. If you had the chance, would you apologize to the people in Hebron? I would say that it's an interesting question and I never thought about it, but uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, bother to to say to apologize to the Palestinians. To the Palestinians. When asked if he would apologize to the people of Hebron, he says, "Why bother?" It's like saying, "Why bother apologizing? Just ignore and hope that the problem goes away." Classic. After the metropolitan of Hebron, will go down south, even more to the south, to the southernest point of the West Bank, uh, to an area that is called Masaferiata. There is a couple of settlements and a lot of unauthorized outposts uh, here in the area, and a lot of settler violence along the years. So all of the Palestinians over here, if they want anything, to dig a new water system, to pave the road, to build a school, they need the authorization of the civil administration, the branch in the IDF that is in charge of all of the bureaucracy of the occupation. So Palestinians in city territories, they just don't get building permits. And if they don't get building permits, they get demolition orders, right? Because everything they build over here is illegal. 
Then we go down to Muzaffariata, where everything is illegal. It's like a game of Monopoly gone wrong. You can't build houses here, but you can build your dream that one day you could play by the rules. And then the idea of come and demolish. So the first thing, by the way, the civil administration demolishes over here in the south of Bonilz area, water systems and toilets. Toilets, yes, toilets. Because if you demolish the water system to a community in the desert, you don't need to demolish all of the things, right? All of the houses, all of the tents and caves, because they don't have water. They cannot live over here. Imagine demolishing water systems just to force people to leave. It's like saying, we want you to pack up and leave, but first, let's make it a little bit inconvenient for you. How thoughtful. And we don't want to put the uh, Palestinians on trucks like uh, uh, the photos from 1948. We want them to leave by, by, themselves. by themselves, exactly. Nadev notes, we don't want to put Palestinians in uh, trucks like the photos of 1948, like a planned eviction. Zanuta used to be a Palestinian cave dwellers uh, village of between 200 and 300 people. And it's a village with, uh, with a school. They suffered attacks from settlers all of the time, all of the time, but also demolition of the civil administrations as well. About a month and a half ago, they left. After uh, they lived over here more than 100 years. Let's not forget about Zentua a village of two to three hundred people who left their village after numerous attacks. Talk about a housewarming gift, except the gift is fear. there's a skull. There's a skull on his uh, on his uniform. These guys are from which unit? It's a unit that they're called the Gmar. A Gmar it's settlers. Uh, units. It means that I'm a settler here, and then I put uniform, and now I'm a soldier over here. Then we have the soldiers with uniform and skulls. Nothing says that we're here to protect you than a skull on a t-shirt. Fashion statement or a threat? You decide. We left Jerusalem, heading to Yavin, just a step away from Gaza. The main settler organizations are holding a conference near the border to select the first Jewish families to settle in Gaza. We are the only media invited to cover it. As we hear Israeli bombs falling on Gaza, they already discuss how much land each family will take and the destiny of the people of Gaza the exile. Finally, we're off to Yenvi, where settlers are discussing settling in Gaza while bombs are dropping on people. Because what is better than uh, planning when there's fireworks in the background? Ladies and 
לראות את עזה כולה ולהבין שמעתה והלאה עזה תהיה כולה יהודית. And they proclaim from now on Gaza will be all Jewish. Who needs diversity when you can have uniformity? Just remember folks, it's all in the name of progress. Thank you for joining me folks and let me know if this video also changed your outlook and do you also stand with Israel?